you could live your life judgment-free. Are you ready to live the unapologetic, confident life that God designed for you? If you are, then this is the place to be. Welcome to the Bold, Brave, and Sassy Show. It's time to break free of physical, spiritual, and heart-centered challenges that have held you back for way too long. Listen in for powerful tips and tools to help you break free today. Hear from leading experts along with me, Annie Berryhill, your host and personal guide to freedom. Now it's time to live like no one's judging. Let's go. Hey there, everybody. This is Annie Berryhill, and welcome to the Bold, Brave, and Sassy Show. Today, we are featuring another amazing guest, and I know that the time that you spend listening to our conversation is really going to encourage you and help you to see that there's a lot of hope, even if you're going through a really tough time. So today is going to be action-packed. It's going to be full of a lot of inspiration and motivation. So today, I want to introduce you to my friend, Kelly Frazier. She is a wife, a mother, a traumatic brain injury survivor. She's a best-selling author of multiple books. She's an international speaker, consultant, and founder of Connecting LLC. She serves her community by feeding the poor, loving the lonely, and praying for the sick. I would say this is a powerhouse woman right here. She knows who she is and what she's here to do. So welcome, Kelly. I'm so glad that you're here with me on the show today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I love doing things like this. And I I can already tell I love you, Annie, and what you represent here is awesome. Oh, well, thank you. See, this is just a love fest here. (laughs) It's cool how God puts us together like that. So Kelly, before we started recording this today, we had a, a bit of a conversation, getting to know each other a little bit, and I don't think that took but two minutes. We're, we're so connected already. It's just been awesome. But I want to let the audience know a little bit more about you, aside from your formal bio. And as we were speaking before, you were telling me a bit about your books. And I think like most authors, we have sort of a purpose in our soul, or we have a a theme in our lives that's really important to us. And that can be born from experiences that we've overcome or things we've learned about ourselves that we really feel is important for other people to benefit from, right? Like we don't go through this life just to have our own experiences. It's really to learn and to help other people. So tell us a little bit about your books and, and kind of how you got into writing and what motivates you to write about what you write about. Such a good question. And I'm very seldom asked that particular question, to be honest. Um, So I did not want to write. In fact, I was the little girl who never kept a diary, who couldn't stand writing, who had the big D's and C's on my English papers. So yeah, that comes as a a surprise, I'm sure. But that's the truth. Um, So you heard in my bio that I was a survivor of traumatic brain injury. And just very briefly on that, in the year of 2007, I had lost my 18-year-old nephew to a drowning, my little sister to cancer, who was his mom. Um, I'd lost almost my marriage because I was traveling between Michigan and Vermont trying to care for the family. And my husband was back home trying to care for our family. And he just felt like, I can't take this anymore, right? And so I had also started a, a business prior to, to leaving and to traveling back and forth. And that business was to help our two oldest teenagers, one was a foster son and then our biological son, to have a direction in life. So that business was an investing company. And we were having such a good time. And the boys were learning a tremendous amount. But my husband had a full-time job working for Whirlpool. Whirlpool, I hope I said that right. <laughs> and... Um, he would come home and then on weekends and nights, he put, you know, all of his time and energy into teaching the boys as well as myself. And so it was a lot. And he asked me to just shut the business down. Well, that broke not just my heart, but the boy's heart as well. But I obeyed. I, I was into that mode of, you know, being a submissive wife, which I don't, I don't want to consider that a mode necessarily as much as it is really a, a command from God that we are submissive to our spouses, but we also have to collaborate as a team. And so that was a big challenge for me because I started this company for them and we were doing great. We were very successful at it. And so it was a very big challenge. So I went into my office one day and I just cried out to God. I'm like, Lord, you put this inside of me. There's something in me that I know, I know that I know that I've got to do something. So we went ahead and um, shut down the business and I, I ended up having a traumatic brain injury at the end of that year from a minor accident. And it was so crazy. I thought, 
okay, Lord, is this what my life is going to be like? And pretty much as I was flying through the air, my words coming flying out of my mouth were, Jesus saved me. I don't know where they came from. I honestly do not know where they came from, but they came flying out before my head hit the pavement. And six months of moving forward, six months of seizures and critical thinking not being there. I could be a two-year-old one morning, the next morning I'd wake up as an adult, but then I would go back to a two-year-old again. It was just insane. So sometimes I'd be paralyzed on my right side. I mean, you just never knew who was going to show up that day. And so my little girl was 11 years old at the time. She became my caregiver. And so six months of that, I remembered one night, I watched her walk out the door and and I remembered those words, Jesus saved me. And I was like, Lord, I know you can heal me. I just don't know why you haven't. But if this is what it's going to be like, I don't want her to go through this anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't want to wake up tomorrow morning. Mm. And just as I said that, this whole piece just came over me and I fell right to sleep. And the next thing I, I remember, I woke up and my head and my um, shoulders were sitting up on my headboard. And I thought, well, this is an odd position for me to wake up in. And when I opened my eyes, there was no pain anywhere in my body. And there was this glow in the room And I sat up and I realized there was no pain and I was like in shock. And I'm thinking, I'm touching my face, my neck, my shoulders. And I'm like, am I awake? Is this my brain happening? What's going on? So when I sat up, I moved my legs down the side of the bed and I was facing my bedroom window. And when I looked out, I noticed that there was no light out there, which meant the sun hadn't come up yet. So I'm thinking, okay, if the sun hasn't come up yet, where is this light coming from? And as I turned to look, almost as if doubting it, the light disappeared. And when the light disappeared, none of what was in the room disappeared. I noticed peace and love and joy and unity and all the things that we long for in this world. That's what was in the room. Mm. And that experience started, something started to shift in inside of me. Everything inside of me wanted to just be grateful. So gratitude just started spilling out of my mouth. God, I'm so grateful for my family. I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for that. Even the deaths of my family members. And I I was not even saying it. It was just coming out of my mouth. And so I remember turning to my right and I picked up this weird little pencil that was sitting on my nightstand. And I said, I even want to thank you for this weird little pencil. (laughs) Just as I said that, these visions started happening in my mind. And this is, it just sounds crazy, but it's exactly what happened. I saw the first vision where I was sitting there writing uh, my signature in books. And it was a book signing, obviously. There were so many people around, but I saw piles and piles of books that I had written, which to me was ridiculous because I was not someone who enjoyed writing. Then the second vision came immediately after that, and I was on a stage talking to so many people. So obviously, I'd become a speaker. And these two things were insane in my mind because I was the most introverted person I had ever met in my life. In fact, I was one of the people who would nudge my husband and say, can you please tell them such and such if we were in a meeting together? And he would do it. (laughs) Very enabling. Um, And then the third vision was that I had touched people lives from all around the world, like in, in holy ways. Like it was so, these things were so crazy to me. And so I even got sarcastic with God. And this is where I get a little bit embarrassed when I say this. I was, I was like, God, how is any of that supposed to happen? And that's exactly how I said it. Very sarcastic. And all I heard come back at me was trust me. Mm. That's what I heard. And it was so exhilarating, but I had no idea what that meant. But I knew that if this environment right here in my room with all of this peace and joy and unity and love and all of that was real, then why would I say no? So the first thing out of my mouth was, okay, right? Just as simple as that. Like I had just made a contract with God. And so what I realize now, of course, is that that was my personal covenant with God. That was my vow to God that I was going to do whatever it is that he asked me to do. So the very first thing that I did was I had a phone call from a girlfriend who said, you've got to get on this call. She says, I don't know why, but I feel like I have to have you get on this call. And I thought, well, I have no idea what it's about, but I'll give it a try. Well, it was a man named Alex Mendocian. Mm -hmm. Alex teaches, at that particular time, he was teaching teleseminarian school, and it was like thousands of dollars, and very late at night on the East Coast, you'd have to stay on the line for like three hours each time. Well, I hung up. I was like, no, that's not for me, and I hung up. She called me the next day, and she said, "Um, how did you do on the call? And I said, "Um, I didn't like it. 
And she goes, so what'd you do? I said, I just hung up. She goes, Kelly, I'm telling you, you've got to get back on that call. So he had another one. So I got back on it. Sure enough, I took the class. I ended up going from teleseminary in school, doing exactly what you're doing now, interviewing all you know people who have done what I saw in that vision. Mm-hmm. And so the very first book that came out was on a airplane, a train, and an automobile. Took 14 hours, and from start to finish, I, my fingers would not stop typing, and it just came out of me as if it flowed. Yeah. So that's how the very first book began, and I recognized at that time you are going to do exactly what you saw in those visions, and I called them dreams at the time, but it was it was a vision. Right. And so that's how it began. That's amazing. That that whole thing is. There's so many points in there where I'm just you know it's jaw dropping. And and not to even underestimate or undervalue the fact that you were sitting in bed, you saw the light, the pain disappeared, and now you were having cognizant thoughts, right? All of a sudden you could think clearly. You were communicating with God on a on a how you'd always been level, right? Conversational, no, no you know, fumbling for words, that kind of thing. So it was so it was so supernatural in in orientation, right? And I remember my dad, my dad had um a blood disease called polycythemia and it always kind of morphs into a chronic leukemia and then to an acute leukemia. And so he kind of had decided that he wasn't going to do anything particular. There was no cure. So he didn't take any measures. He just kind of came home and, you know, just lived out whatever time he had. But I remember one day I came over and he, you know, I grew up in a Catholic family. So we didn't, and I was going to a Christian church since I was in my twenties because I, I really had a, I, my relationship with Jesus became, you know, was like tw- when I was 20. So I grew up in Catholic church. And so he was Catholic. And I remember one day I walked into the house just to confirm what you're saying. And my dad was saying something and I was, you know, talking and he goes, I have to tell you what happened today. And I was like, what? And he said, I was just standing there and it was like a minute. No, it was like a second. Mm. This feeling started at my feet and worked its way all the way up to my body, all the way through the top of my head. And all it was, was this pure peace that just filled me completely. Now, this is very uncharacteristic of my dad to talk like this, you know, but he, you know, when you're contemplating and facing death, like I think people get a lot more real, but it's just really to give people who are listening confirmation that this is not like a weirdo anomaly for, you know, brain injury, Kelly, that she was imagining this, like, this is how God works. And this is what he does for us. My, I don't think my dad ever prayed for healing. It, we, he just accepted his fate and we accepted that he accepted it. It was his life to you know do whatever, but he did experience a peace that really had eluded him his entire life, his mm-hmm. entire life. So it's such a beautiful thing to understand that when we can be filled with that peace, the, the place that we operate from is so much different because you did have so many things to be angry about, frustrated about, you know, bitter about. And yet what came out of that was gratitude because you were filled with that, all of those good things that, you know, fruit of the spirit kind of deal. Right? That's a beautiful story. And you're absolutely right. I mean, just like your dad, I, it was out of character for me too. This was not something that I would ever have spoken about before. In fact, I think it, Annie, it really took me a long time to actually share that story because I just did not know how to share it. And so I think it was actually right after the first book that all of that started to come out. But it does take time sometimes because it's not what we're used to. We know that people are going to think, okay, yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh, right? (laughs) That's a little (laughs) woo-woo. Right. But I mean, it's, it's a very powerful moment that I don't know if I'll ever experience again quite like that. But I know I've had so many hundreds and hundreds of moments since then with God and with other people that have just been only God, only God could have produced. I, I think it's interesting too, because it's, it's funny how many people will embrace the idea of a supernatural experience, but not God. Yeah. Right? All the other ways of a supernatural experience and zombies, you know, those kind of things, you know, those supernatural kind of things, but they forget how God is so omnipresent in the past, the present, the future, now in your, in your spirit, outside your spirit, in the natural, not in the natural, all of these things that he's shown himself to be throughout the course of the Bible and just the stories of people that they've experienced that like he is our personal guy, right? Mm -hmm. He knows us. 
And, and I think what happens is when you have an experience like that, it's, it's a craving, I think, that we just develop. I want more of that, which is really just his presence. Mm-hmm. Not just his presence, but it's really his presence. Right. And we always remember that. And just like most experiences that we remember, they're tied into emotions, right? So it's not just the experience, but when there's high emotions, it's really, really ingrained and senses. So we really remember those and we can recall those and we can remember those. I mean, I've had experiences that are going to, I mean, I don't, I don't think that I really ever told anybody, but like experiences where I was in sort of a quasi dream state where I asked him to show me the universe and there was nothing around me, but universe and the vastness of like, it makes me want to cry right now because who am I that just because I asked him, he would not just show me, but like take me there. It, it's, it sounds so nutty. And I'm sorry if you're listening to this and you're like, <laughs> these ladies are nuts. You yeah. know, this is nuts, but this is, this is him. You know, this, he wants to be that close to us. He is that close to us. It's us who turn away and stop talking to him and stop having relationship with him or put it on hold or do other things, you know, but it's, it's so powerful. And one of the things that we did talk about before we started, we have a lot of overlap in what is valuable to us. And I think it's because we love him. And so he instills in us what's valuable to him and what he wants to spend, teach us to spend our time doing and teaching. Right. And two of those things, well, the main thing is freedom. And so in your, in your books, in your experience and talking to people and consulting and speaking, what would you say the number one thing is that people want freedom from or in? Yeah, that's, oh, wow. <laughs> that is so vast. And if I were to ask Jesus that, I believe he would just say from the enemy, period, in general, just totally freedom, freedom from the enemy. But as a human being, if if I were to, here's a great example. I went to the park one day and um, I was, this was after many, many programs I had developed. Uh, one about self-care, one about uh, having, it's called Love Differently, Stay Married. I mean, there's numerous programs, coaching programs that I had developed and they're all online and that kind of thing. And I was thinking about these programs as I finished up in my gym and my gym is outdoors. Okay. I don't go to an indoor gym. I go to an outdoor gym and there's equipment and everything like every other, you know, hundred yards. And so I was finishing up, I got in my car and as I sat in my car, I realized I'm the only car in the entire parking lot. And so that's when I heard talk to the girl on the cell phone. And, and I thought, what? Like, I didn't hear it audibly. I heard it inside. And I was like, but Lord, there's no woman here on a cell phone, right? So I'm backing out. And I know how my life works with God. If he's telling me something, it's going to show up. I just have to wait for it, right? And so I'm backing up the car. And as I'm pulling out, and this again, I had to drive a couple hundred yards to, to get out through the gate. I see this girl who's sitting down on the side of the road in the grass with her cell phone. And I thought, oh, there she is. Lord, you're so good. I was so excited. But I had no idea what I was supposed to say to her. When you see a a young lady who's sitting on the side of the road in the grass on her cell phone, the last thing she's going to want probably is someone, some stranger to pull up next to her, right? For sure. (laughs) Yeah. So I got out of the car and very slowly, I just, I held up my hand and I said, ma'am, please don't, don't be upset. Don't be scared. I just would like to come and talk to you for a minute because I have a question to ask you. I had no idea what I was going to ask her. I didn't even know if God wanted me to ask her a question, but all of a sudden I felt her intense pain, mm-hmm. suicidal thinking, high, high anxiety, total fear, total stress and worry. And I knew that a lot of it had to do with financial stuff. And so I, when I walked closer to her, God was showing me all this. Now the scripture talks about words of knowledge and words of wisdom. And so this was words of knowledge that he was giving me when he said that there's a girl who is sitting on the side of the road with her cell phone. That was a word of knowledge. But the word of wisdom came as I walked closer to her and he's now telling telling me what it is that she struggles with. So as I went closer to her, I explained to her how I got in my car and I heard this inner voice say that there was a young lady sitting here who honestly felt desperate. And so as I started speaking these words, she just looked at me in awe, in complete utter awe. And she just started crying. And I said, may I please pray for you? And she just 
shook her head. She didn't say a word because she was crying. I put my hand on her shoulder, lifted my other hand and just said, Jesus, you're the one who wants to heal her. You're the one who knows this girl. I know without a doubt that you are going to not only save her life, but you are going to give her life. And so just praying that little prayer and it just took that long to do, but it makes everyone feel so awkwardly uncomfortable to do it. And Mm -hmm. that's the key right there. I believe that every single person on the face of this planet deals with so much stress because of the way our sinful world lives that we have to learn to get out of our, I'm going to call it what it is, a dirty diaper, get out of our dirty diaper and just get, be willing to take it off because it stinks and clean yourself up, walk forward bare naked and just say, Lord, I'm here. I am ready to be used by you. And when you can do that, you will save lives. And Mm -hmm. that's what happened to that girl that day. And that's what's happened to so many people since then, because I'm willing to be used. And so for answering that question, which I know I'm giving long answers to your quick questions, it's just, that's I, what I believe that Jesus wants us to be doing. And so I'm willing to do that, to stop people from having this anxiety, to set people free from anxiety and fear and stress and worry. Yeah. Hey there, it's Annie. Just popping by in the middle of this episode to ask you a couple quick questions. Have you been feeling stuck? Are you asking yourself, How did I end up here in my life? When did I lose control? I don't know if you know my story, but I've been through plenty of challenges of my own and I found my way back, but it wasn't without a struggle. And now I want to help you find a way back too. And I want it to be easier and faster than my own experience. So what I'd like to do is to offer you a free strategy session. All you need to do is go to www.boldbravesassyshow.com and click on the strategy session link that's right below the heading of that page. You'll see a little opt-in box. In that 30-minute session, I promise I can help you find some clarity through the challenges so that you can start to live more of the unapologetically confident life that God designed for you. I hope you'll take advantage of this super special offer. There's only a few spots and they're really going fast. Take care. Now back to the show. I think, you know, there's no other reason why it would be put in the Bible 365 times. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Get off that train because it's a normal human condition. It's set up that the enemy is going to go after us. Every single one of us, even those who are non-believers, so to speak, they're still made by God. They're, God still loves them. They're just not there yet, you know, and, and they have importance as well. And they, the enemy wants to do everything he can to keep them from getting to God, right? By creating things. I was listening to a teacher the other day and she was talking about really, and I like it like bullet points, like just don't tell me the fluffy stuff about how this works. How does this really work? You know, and, and how the enemy and, and, will use your own voice, your own first person speech in your head to make you think that what you're thinking is coming from you, Mm -hmm. right? He, I mean, the enemy was there when God created the human being. He knows everything, just like he knows the word of God as well as anyone, right? He knows how God intricately made us and he uses every possible, you know, flaw against us. Right. And that's what happens. And people don't realize what a trap it is to start, you know, so the way that it goes is, okay, so you have, they whisper a thought to you. You're no good at that. You shouldn't try that. And you think it's you. And then you think, yeah, that's right. I shouldn't try that. The moment you agree with it. Now, guess what? They will take up residence on your couch with their shoes on, with their dirty boots on, and they will not leave. They will not leave until presented with an authority who can kick them out. That's right. Right. And, and, and so many people don't realize the simplicity of it. And, and not only that, because in, in the reality, this is, this is sort of the vision that God gave me about explaining this because he always gives me like word pictures, which turn out to be like analogies, right? Mm -hmm. This guy knocks on the door and he says, I want to come in and live here. And you look at him and you go, no, he goes, yeah, I'm going to come in here and live here. And he, and he beats you down. He says the same thing. I'm going to come in here and live here because you have to let me or whatever he says, right? Finally, he beats you down and you open the door and you let him in. 
Now he never leaves. And so you call the cops and they kick him out. Guess who the cop is? Guess who the authority is? Man. Right? Just gave me chills. That's right. awesome. Great right? analogy. Yes. Right? So it, when we realize that, I think a lot of us are even afraid if we realize that that's happening because we have a fear of that enemy right? But he can't have power over us when we invoke the power and the authority that God gives us by being his kids. That's right. right. We are, I'm the daughter of the most high king of the universe. That means I'm a princess in the kingdom, right. right? How does the king treat his princess? What authority, what responsibility does he give her, him as a prince, right? And we don't walk in that. And so I tell, I've told the story on, on other, other shows, but in January, I had woken up in the middle of the night and I had a stomach ache, I had a headache, I was sweating and it was from the wine that I had had the night before. Yet again, I was in this situation. And I tell people I'm not, I'm a drinker. I was a drinker, but I was not a drunk. Like I just, it was just social, it was just habit, you know, all these things. And I started to realize over a few years of my life, like this is just a bad habit. It's not that I really want to do this. I don't see the upside. It's just poison. What am I doing with my life, right? But in the middle of the night, I got so, forgive my non-Christianese, pissed off because I saw it as a force, that alcohol was a force, basically the enemy, right? And I, I just looked at it. I just, I don't know what it was. I just said, get out. I hate you. And I even heard God say, it's a righteous anger. Mm. It's a righteous hate, right? I hate you. You don't do anything good for me. You don't do anything good for anybody. I'm sick of you. It's time for you to leave and you don't get to come back. And can I tell you that I never once since that day have even wanted a drink. In fact, when I think about it, it makes me feel physically sick. Wow. Isn't that weird? That's, that's not weird at all. That's how it works. That's how it works. And we make it so complicated and we make it so full of, it's like, we're afraid to fight fear. Whoa, wait a minute. We're afraid to fight fear with the authority that we have. Just, I would, I would just say, try it. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Put it to work. No, you know, the, the first thought comes in your head. Hey, you're nothing. You suck. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have any value. You can't do that. It's not for you. Right. And, and, and instead of going, oh man, yeah, I'm, I'm so not good. No, stop. I'm not listening to you. Get out. I am, get out. I am good. I am worthy. I am awesome. Give me a high five right? You, you really, it's like, you have to like tell that to talk to the hand, right? You are, you are not getting here. You, you do not have access to me anymore and they can't continue to harass you unless you give them permission, Mm -hmm. unless you agree and say, yes, you're right. And the moment you do that, then they bring on the feelings that reinforce the doubt, the fear, right? Then it becomes deeper and deeper and more familiar, and the less you realize it's them and the more you think it's you, that's how they get you. So here's another great example of that. I was talking to, well, we have a live event coming up November 10th. Um, it's called Set Free Connecting You to God, Yourself, and Each Other. And in that event, there's supposed to be a comedian. And I was talking to the comedian this morning and um, not they're supposed to be, there is going to be a comedian. When I was talking with him this morning though, he said something that I found very profound because this is what most of us actually end up doing. He said, you know, he goes, when I think about being on your stage, he says, it humbles me because I know that the Holy Spirit's presence is going to, presence is going to be there. And he said, so every day since you've asked me, he goes, I've been saying, Lord, forgive me for my my pride and my arrogance. Forgive me for my pride and arrogance. And I said to him, what if instead of asking God for for forgiveness for pride and arrogance, what if you just praised him for humility and love instead? Mm -hmm. I said, because what you're doing there is you're, you're actually telling the enemy that you still deal with this every single day. But if you're actually set free from those things, then the opposite of those things would be humility and love, right? And he goes, whoa. And I said, well, think about it. Whatever we focus on expands. If we focus on Jesus, it's going to expand. If you focus on love and humility, it's going to expand. And you won't ever have to say ever again, forgive me for my pride or arrogance, right? Exactly. Well, I think it's a, it's a great, powerful example of how easy it is for us to get into that mode of, put, of putting on the dirty diaper and leaving it on, mm-hmm. as opposed to taking it off and focusing on something completely different, which feels raw and naked sometimes, but that's where we are called to live. Exactly. I, I like what you said too, because there's that whole idea, not the idea, there's the truth that God spoke 
creation into existence. Words have power. So when we, and again, I love understanding the science of the human brain and how we work. The, the, the idea, the concept that when you say, I don't want to be prideful, your brain hears, I want to be prideful. It doesn't process the don't. This is science. This isn't woo-woo stuff. This is science. Our brains don't do that. So to say instead the identity that you are. So for me, I'm not sober. I'm a non-drinker. Exactly. It, it has nothing to do with being a drunk or being an alcoholic. And I'm not discounting people who are and struggle with that. I'm saying I'm a non-drinker. That is, I am. I am a non-drinker. I am humble. Right. So there's that, that straddle of saying like, I totally embrace all the gifts and talents and skills and experiences that God has bestowed on my life. I am not going to discount those for one single second, but in that I am humble. Amen. I am. It's, I, I think the whole idea of what you're saying is you can burn into your brain. I am statements because they are directly connected to your identity. And when we have an identity, everything that we do are from our identity come our beliefs. From our, from our beliefs come our thoughts, from our thoughts come our emotions, from our emotions come our actions, and from our actions, we create our environment, Amen. right? So it all stems back to what we believe about ourselves in the I am. I am a non-drinker. I am the kind of person who puts God first. I am a person who's committed. I am a person who keeps my promises, right? Mm-hmm. And, and while that's self centered in the sense that you're talking about yourself, when we relate them back to what God's already said about us, I am the daughter of the most high King. Now, when you stop and think about that for a second, a what girl doesn't want to be a princess, Mm. right? Or the concept of what that means to be a princess in terms of your worth, your value, your position, (laughs) your beauty, your capability, all of those things. When you have someone who adores you and believes in you 100%, <laughs> that's essentially being a princess, right? Yes, exactly. Right? So I think it's really the key is those I am statements. I actually have some of those too. I call them the 52 declarations where they're able to, it's, it's framed a little bit differently because the I am, it's in there as well, but it's really taking scripture and talking to people in how God would whisper mm-hmm. to them who they are. That exactly. same thing. And it's so important because you and I encounter people every single day. I, I coach nutrition, specifically nutrition, but even in that, I have spent probably more time coaching women on their self-worth and self-esteem and getting over hurdles unrelated to nutrition because in my understanding and from what I've learned from working with people is that problem with your physical body is rooted in a broken identity or belief about yourself. And so that's the work that I do. It's very similar to what you do. It's, it's helping people go down that path to dig into the root, dig into the seed and replant or pull out the weed and start over or reprogram that in the sense that we're like, let's put some truth into this. Let's fertilize it with truth. Exactly. Right. That's exactly right. <laughs> and you do an amazing work with people because so many people need this desperately. And if they can turn to someone who has already been able to accomplish and achieve that, that belief system about themselves and that that's what they work toward. It doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect for you every day, but it's something that you have already achieved and you've been pretty successful with that. So that's, you're the kind of person that people need to learn from. And so for me, it's like, Being able to talk with other leaders in this world who know who they are in Jesus Christ, know their identity and how powerful and how much authority they have, what a gift that is. Just really just being here and meeting you today has been a super gift for me. Well, I think that's the iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And as we were talking about before we even started this conversation, we do such similar things. We're different people and we've come from different backgrounds, although some of our background is of similar type that it is, it could be easy to conceive of you or perceive of you as being a threat or competition. Mm -hmm. But if you, if me as a human being with a brain who loves people and talks to people all the time, start doing the math, that there's no way that you or I, or you and I together could serve all the brokenhearted people who need the freedom that we have found alone. Mm -hmm. 
right? God is, God is raising an army of people who have overcome their own personal struggles, trials, anxiety, physical maladies. And, and by overcome, I don't mean necessarily made perfect, but have accepted themselves in this new normal. You know, I mean, all you have to do is get older <laughs> to learn about acceptance. You're like, well, dang, I just can't do that anymore. Right. I never thought this would happen to me, <laughs> you know? And, and I think one of the things too, that people who, when they think about Jesus or God, they think about the rules and they're so turned off by the rules. Just like a parent is the guardrails for their child to keep them safe and out of trouble. You can have a lot of fun with God, when you understand that, like, all he wants is for you to be safe. Mm -hmm. All he wants for you to be is protected. But sometimes he gives us the ability to step outside of the guardrails and get into the dark, scary spaces. And people, I think they really underestimate how much fun you can have because there's a fun in, in pulling over and having total confirmation that what God told you was true. You're like, that is so cool, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There, it's so. Fun. And when you're, I guess when you're in relationship with him and you're surrendered to him and when you're surrendered in the best way, like, Lord, let's have an adventure. And to me, my whole life has been people are an adventure. And all of the time he, he strips away all these things like being really opinionated or being really judgy. And that's why on my show, it's like, live like no one's judging. How, how does that feel to like be the person that doesn't judge and live as if no one's judging? How would you do that? You, you wouldn't be in fear of what other people think. So here's a, here's a great, great example of how fear can totally tear away what God wants to establish in you. When I first started seeing these images, as I was telling you in, in these visions, I, it, I have to admit, I was pretty fearful at certain times because like in the first book that I wrote, it was part of my story. And I was like, I didn't ever anticipate my story getting out there. That was pretty scary, right? So I had to ask my siblings, there's five siblings, I had to ask each one of them to read it, approve of it, you know, tell me how they felt about it. That was scary. So all these different things were scary. Now I sat on that book for months because I was too afraid to actually publish it. Mm -hmm. So one day I was sitting there and I was like, Lord... I, I know you've asked me to do this and I'm so sorry that I haven't done it. I just don't know how to get over my fear. And you know what I saw? Another image quickly about me sitting in a white water rafting class five uh, river. And I was like, what? Why am I seeing that? The very afternoon, my husband says, hey, how about if we take a class five river raft trip? I think that would be so awesome. I was blown away. <laughs> so here's what has happened since then. That was back in 2010, I think, or 2011. Since then, every single time God asked me to move into a higher level of being, which just simply, you know, it means just doing something that that I've never done before that might take a lot more resources and a lot more challenge intellectually or spiritually and physically, then I go and do something that is so scary, like go to Mexico to hang upside down by my ankles on a zip line that is over a rainforest. That's, you know, the elevation is so high. It's always things like that because I know that if I can do that, then my fear factor of doing what God has called and asked me to do will not be as high. And that, that's just me. That's how I get over my fears. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody has to find what works for them. And so I know that, you know, you you and I were talking about that earlier, that part of what you do is help people remove their fear. Mm -hmm. I, I really hope to encourage and strengthen people to overcome their fear, at, but tactically. Mm. Right. So it's not just lip service. Mm. I want to teach people how you take every thought captive because when my son was, and I've talked about this before, when my son was deployed to Afghanistan as a combat Marine, he was a machine gunner. So he was on the ground that, you know, you've told me that you also had a, a, a have a son that was uh, in the military. Mm -hmm. I would be driving and the enemy would bombard me with the worst possible thoughts of outcome for him. And it, it was, it was a barrage. It was like a meteor shower in my mind of awfulness. Right. And I remember driving and crying and I heard, take every thought captive, take every thought captive. And my, in my mind's eye, 
I saw myself like taking a lasso and like doing the big cowboy thing and wrapping them up. And then with one big swing, like throwing them to heaven, mm-hmm. like, and, and having to do that over and over and over until I won. Right. Until we won, God and I won where he's just like, yep, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Cause he's going to keep trying. He's going to, they're going to keep trying to bombard you. And, and that's practical. I know that sounds really dumb because it was an imagination, but guess what? That's how it works in the spiritual realm. That's right. Right. Yeah. If you're going to get attacked through that avenue, you're going to be able to fight within that avenue. That's right. Right. And, and it really is, you know, growing up in a, in a very volatile, uh, unstable environment taught me to be a fighter early. I think I was wired as a fighter anyway, because I have other siblings who didn't fight and that's just who I am. That's just, just who I am. And for you being a bit more introverted, he grows you and stretches you and evolves you, right? In, in ways for me, like, it's funny because I do CrossFit and I've been CrossFitting for like 10 years. And I feel like every single day there's a challenge that comes up in that, that I think I shouldn't be able to do that at 52. And then I do. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and I'm good at it or I'm getting better at it. And it, it really, helps my confidence to grow that like I can continue to evolve and get stronger. And if I can do it in the physical, I can do it in every aspect of my life. That's exactly right. I mean, seriously, just in what December and, and I, we're, you know, we're really talking about people, you know, who are in their, their, um, I want to say elderly years. These are not elderly years. These are, you know, years where we're a little bit older. Um, we often use the excuse, oh, I'm too old for that. Oh, no. oh, oh, that's just my age. Oh, well, you know, when you get my age. And I, I think to myself, just stop. It doesn't matter how old we are. There's a, a lady named Ernestine who's 80 years old who is a bodybuilder. And yeah. she looks literally like she's in her 30s. It's crazy. It's crazy. And I sit there and I think to myself, Lord, we have got to stop giving ourselves so many excuses. And I, I personally don't want to give myself any more excuses. So I will go and do things like climb a tree 75 foot up in the air, take a rope and jump from it because I don't want to get to that place where I'm using my age as an excuse. So I'm really glad to hear you say that because I think too many of us use that, you know, and it's, it's not true, but it is in our mind if that's what we believe. It, it is very much what we believe, what we've created and concocted as our own little safety zone. And there are certain people, certain personality types that definitely, definitely lean towards avoiding discomfort at all costs. I know a lot of people like that and that's hardwired and it's very difficult. For, it, it's funny. They're the most difficult people to start change, but once they change, they are the most loyal to the finish. Yes. Well, so, that was me. I, I was totally like that. Exactly as you described, my brain would never allow me to move past anything to be successful in it at all. But it took a brain injury and for God to show me what I could be in him to be able to move into this place where now I don't, I mean, I don't care what it is. If it's something that it, it involves adventure, if it involves God, if it involves people, I'm there because yeah. That's what he's put inside of me now. And I'm, I'm so blessed and I'm so grateful. I'm looking at this little um, thing that I have sitting here on my desk. It's just like a plaque. It says, only God can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into triumph, a victim into victory. And that was me. That is why that's sitting there because that is so powerful. But it's not just me. It's people who are listening to this too. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's beautiful when you think about it like that. It is. I was, I was right before I got on to record with you, I was reading something about someone who said, you know, Facebook's really wearing me down today or this week. It's been a really hard week on Facebook. And I, I wrote in there and I was like, why, why do you have to absorb everything that you read just because you have a perspective or an opinion and you feel like somebody's against you? You don't have to take that on. And that's where we get those choices. I know that's a little bit of a divergence from like what you just said, but it made me think of it because every single day we, we have the power through decision to not let that be a factor, whether it's not wanting to be uncomfortable, not wanting to change because change is so scary. I always, I'm so oppositional in a sense and and not in a bad way, but if somebody says you can't, my next words are watch me. 
<laughs> you know, I, don't ever tell me that you don't think I can. I mean, that's, I'm such a sucker for that. Like people could probably manipulate me a lot, you know, because of that. But at the same time, let's do opposite day. If you typically don't like to be uncomfortable, then the thing you actually have to do is to be more uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't tend to, I like to be uncomfortable. I like the edge. I like the edge of a deadline. I'll always write my papers and case studies for programs that I'm in pretty much about 24, 48 hours before they're due because that's how I roll. That's how I do it. Maybe the stretch for me is to start earlier just to see, right? There is a lot of adrenaline rush in a, in a deadline. But so Kelly, this has been fantastic, amazing. I think I know that people who are listening to this are just going to be wowed. And it's maybe even an episode that you're going to have to listen to more than once because there's a lot of meat in here. There's a lot of practical and tactical things for people to be able to utilize here. And I'm just so thankful that you've been so open and so willing to come on and share this with people. You're just an amazing, you're just a force. I love it. You're a force of good and love and you're not letting people get away with their excuses anymore. And I love it. Yeah. Well, God bless you for what you're doing. And I appreciate being on the show, not just to share my story, because it's really less about my story and much more about heaven's story. Once you learn to to accept and collaborate with God and his heart for us. I think anybody can do this. Anybody can. Uh, you know, a lot of people will say, Kelly, you do it because you're anointed. I don't do it because I'm anointed. I do it because I love my Lord and mm. Savior. That's the reason why I do it. So I just, I pray for anybody who's listening that that is exactly the reason why they will get up in the morning and realize their day is not for the boss. It is not for their children. It is not for their husband. It is not for them, but it is for our Lord. How will you live it if that's how you live? I, I love that. That's beautiful words. And I really do subscribe to that. I, I have this saying that when I'm, in a situation where I have a problem or I have to create something, I just go, you know, Lord, you are the guy that created creating. And I'm pretty sure you have a million more better ideas about how to handle this than I do. So I'm going to take myself off of the God throne and allow you to work in my life. And it, it's crazy. I don't know why people resist inviting that into their life because it is the perfect word is the collaboration. He doesn't want to take over he will, but he, he wants us to work together. It's that whole oxen thing. You know, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right. And I remember somebody saying this description was like, God is the big oxen, the established adult oxen. And we're this little one who thinks we're carrying the yoke, but it's really just a play yoke. It's not anything. We think we're driving, but we're not. It's really the big ox that's doing all the work. And I look at that and I, I laugh when I see myself in that image because I think, I think I'm doing it, but I really know he's doing it, but that's okay because I'm walking with him. You yeah. know, yeah. it's, it's beautiful. So thank you so much for spending time with me today. And I really have enjoyed everything that you've said. I've been inspired. I can't wait to go back and listen to this and really dig in and, and find all just the super sparkly gems to be able to share. And as always with the show, when you're listening, you'll be able to connect to the show notes, connect to Kelly and, and the resources that she's talked about and that she has. And I thank you once again for listening into the show. This has been a powerful time and I hope that it's blessed you wildly, wildly. It's a great adventure to partner with God, to collaborate with God. And I hope that you have more confidence and more surety that that's the path to take. So thank you again for listening to the Bold, Brave, and Sassy show. I hope you'll come back, subscribe on iTunes, tell your friends, leave a review. All of those things help greatly to get it into more people's lives. Thank you so much. See you next time.